I, I don't receive the email right now. You don't, you cannot share? Uh, but it was okay uh, earlier when you <laughs> shared it. <laughs> yes, it was. Now, oh, can you okay. see? It's, it's, we can see okay, our screen we're better, now. we're better. Yep, Sorry. Yep. Even, yep. Just like Feng Ting, I pressed the wrong button from time okay. to time. <laughs> okay, can you see uh, the, the slide? Now I put it on slide view. Yes, Okay. very good, yes. Okay, so once again, thank you very much for this opportunity. I really, really enjoy getting the chance to uh, share uh, the results of some uh, work that I've been doing on behalf of the United Nations Environment Program, and to be able to share that with Songji University with the idea of looking forward to research opportunities and collaboration is actually uh, uh, something that I enjoy very much. And I guess, um, one thing I'd like to say that this is an environment assessment. It is an assessment of the science. It's not a fundamental science. What it does is it tries to bring various aspects of, uh, in this case, the Sioux wetlands together so that you can better inform policy. Uh, that is the idea of an integrated environmental assessment, bringing the different pieces together to better inform policy. I guess the key message that I would like to leave you with at the end of the day is that uh, you have a better understanding of the interplay between science, policy, and politics. And, and as you understand that interplay, the research opportunities uh, multiply. So now I'm going to my next slide. Let's see. Uh, and uh, can you see uh, presentation outline just to make sure that we're, uh, that's it, everything okay? Okay, so uh, just a quick overview of the presentation today. I'll start uh, in part one with uh, the geography and politics of the Nile Basin. Uh, and then I will relate that, uh, that uh, overview to the uh, specific uh, situation in the uh, sued wetlands. And then in part three, it will present aspects of hydro meteorology, uh, climate change and greenhouse gases for the sued and relate these aspects to ecosystem services, which is in part four. And I'll close the presentation with a policy relevant research program for the Sioux wetlands that could be of interest for the international community. Certainly it's of interest for UNEP and it is something that we can investigate going forward. I'll get examples of graduate level research ideas. So we go on with part one. So this is uh, an overview. And uh, we start with the big picture. First of all, on the left side, you see geography. On the right side, you see politics. So, so as you look at uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, map, it's basically of the subcatchments of the uh, Nile River Basin. Uh, up in yellow, you see the Desert Nile. Down in the further south, you see the largest area, which is actually that which is to the White Nile. You also see in Ethiopia, the Blue Nile and a smaller uh, catchment area called the Atbara. The important thing to note here is that the Blue Nile, although it's smaller in terms of surface area, is actually uh, contributing up to 65% of the surface flow into the Nile River. So that is of uh, prime importance for the Egyptians who live downstream. The White Nile on the other hand uh, contributes in the area of maybe 23, 25%, even though it has the largest uh, uh, surface area. And I guess the other important uh, factor in terms of the geography is that there are 11 countries that share administrative boundaries with the catchment area. So you can imagine that trying to come uh, to some kind of agreement amongst these countries might be a bit difficult at times. In terms of the politics uh, of this, uh, uh, of the region, uh, one of the things is that the Britain had already, uh, uh, Great Britain, when they were the colonial power in this region, they had already understood the importance of the water flow to the Nile. And back in 19, 1902, they were able to uh, uh, negotiate with the king of Ethiopia to prevent any work on the Blue Nile that obstructed water flow into the Nile's other uh, tributaries. And then through the years, 1906, 25, 
29 and 59, there was a series of agreements between Egypt, Sudan, and Britain, all with the intent of protecting the water supply for uh, the Nile River into uh, Egypt. Uh, I should mention that these colonial agreements were granted by Egypt are, uh, uh, and Sudan, they were, they were granted to Egypt and Sudan, but without so much uh, uh, discussing with the other upstream countries and uh, with, uh, particularly with Ethiopia didn't uh, uh, receive that much attention in some of these ag agreements. Of course, at that time, you know, large dams and uh, things like that were not a, uh, so much of an issue. Uh, so basically the key message here is that uh, you have a complicated geography and history and Egypt is at the end of the pipeline. So keep that in mind. Go on to the next slide. And uh, as you might expect, and you have heard in the news, there has been some tension between, for example, Egypt and Ethiopia. On one hand, you have upstream countries uh, such as Ethiopia constructing dams for energy and irrigation and agriculture to support economic development. And downstream countries uh, fear that their lifeline is being threatened. And uh, international negotiations, uh, uh, Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia, with support from the USA, UK, and others, have been there to find a water sharing agreement, but uh, uh, it's still a work in progress. And there still is a concern, certainly from the Egyptians in terms of the water flow that supports their lives. So um, maybe just to say that uh, both sides have real and valid concerns, uh, whether you need the water is yours to develop your country or whether you need that water for your survival, both concerns are valid. So these international negotiations on the Nile River are very important. Uh, maybe just uh, stop one second. Jessica, can, can you hear me uh, okay? Uh, is everything okay so far? Yes, it's okay. I can hear. Okay, fine. Just checking, just checking. So into this uh, international water politics, you also have competing science. Uh, science is not just one voice, it's many voices. And in this particular case, I, I cite one study from uh, uh, Egyptian authors uh, saying that the rapid filling of this giant dam, it's called the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, could reduce water supplies to downstream, e downstream Egypt by more than one third and possibly destabilize a politically volatile part of the world. So that's one uh, view that the scientists of, uh, uh, find in the published uh, literature. And then there's another view uh, uh, from uh, other authors. Uh, another uh, view from other authors showing the uh, grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, showing that it, it, it will not threaten the water supply to Egypt. Uh, and Jessica, I would just encourage all other participants to mute their uh, microphones uh, so that uh, there's no competition for the airway. Yeah, I just okay. did. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and I just wanted to mention this because the, the work that uh, Feng Ting, Professor Feng Ting Lee has shared with me on the exacerbation of future water scarcity and spatial inequality in the Nile River. Uh, I, I, I didn't get a year on that. Maybe it's, uh, it's in uh, press. But uh, that team conducted a spatial temporal dynamic projection of water scarcity looking at precipitation, population, and gross uh, domestic uh, product, gross uh, domestic product in these countries uh, and uh, simulating forward to 2050. What they found is that uh, regions with higher population density and GDP will face uh, more serious water scarcity and the uneven distribution of water scarcity uh, uh, is expected is projected to increase and possibly uh, creating further tension in the region. So this kind of research has importance and uh, particularly when it is seen in the background that I've just mentioned is that uh, water is a very limiting factor, especially uh, when you are at the end of the pipeline. So this uh, research uh, uh, shared with me is, is quite relevant. So we now we go to uh, uh, part two. So we've looked at the big picture. Now we focus on the uh, sewed wetlands. And we start with a map. And in this map, you see uh, uh, the, the, the administrative boundaries of the uh, Sud wetlands. You see Uganda, Kenya, where I am right now. I'm in uh, Nairobi as, as I deliver this lecture. You see Uganda, and you see the Nile, the White Nile River leaving Uganda, passing through Juba, 
uh, going into uh, the town of Bor, uh, and then it curves to the west, and then back to the east, and it comes uh, and this Sud Swamp area ends in uh, Malakau. Now, in your mind, if you were to draw a straight line between the town of Bor, there north of Juba, to the town of Malakau on the northern side of uh, South Sudan, basically you would find a way to uh, avoid passing water to the Sud uh, Swamp. So actually that is something which, uh, which happened, uh, which, which ha has been discussed and we'll, talk, we'll, uh, we'll discuss that. But in that, uh, you see the, you see that uh, area of the Sud Swamp. And I guess the message that I want to leave with you on this slide is that it acts like a sponge, a sponge, in that uh, like a sponge, it soaks up water and then it releases it slowly. And that slow release of water acts to moderate uh, the environment, the climate in that area, and in turn provides ecosystem services. We'll go into that now. Uh, there's some, uh, uh, again, uh, going back to the water politics side of the Sud wetlands, uh, the idea of a canal to reroute the White Nile around the Sud, going from the town of Bor to Malakau, uh, has been around. It was first proposed by the British in uh, 1907 at the same time that they were discussing with the Egyptians. Construction actually started in 1978, but it was suspended in 1983 due to the outbreak of a civil war after some 240 kilometers of a 360 uh, kilometer distance had been finished. So it was, it was, it was like two thirds done, but the civil war broke out. And in fact, it was said to be one of the triggers for the war for independence because uh, at that time, Sudan was one country, there was no South Sudan, it was all Sudan. And the people in the South uh, objected to the fact that water was being taken from them without any consultation. So uh, uh, back in uh, 1983, during the uh, rebellion at that time, they actually uh, kidnapped uh, the uh, operators of the canal digging excavation device. And uh, that, was, uh, that was possibly one of the triggers uh, to the Civil War. Going to the next slide. And here we see a satellite image uh, of the excavated and possible final section of the Jongle Canal. That's the name of the canal. In uh, green on the left, you see an outline of the uh, Sud Swamp area. And then in yellow, you can see what already has been excavated. And in the dotted line, that which is, remains to be uh, excavated since 1983. And then on the inset uh, uh, message on uh, in, on the inset, you see uh, a picture of the excavator, which has been sitting there since 1983 uh, on the lower right hand side. Going to the next slide. Um, so one of the big questions that is being discussed uh, in uh, South Sudan is uh, uh, should this canal Dongle Canal be completed. And on one side, there was there has been a call for, for the resumption of the Dongle Canal to prevent flood uh, disaster. And this was uh, as recent as as, as recent as uh, earlier this year. And uh, the reason why that uh, this 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 new initiative is coming forward is because there's been serious problems with flooding, which I'll explain. Uh, and the, and the Ministry of Environment and Forestry uh, had requested a United Nations Environment Program to conduct a rapid environmental assessment of the Sud because they were concerned that uh, uh, some uh, infrastructure would be put in place uh, without considering the environmental consequences. So let's take a look at uh, the land cover map. This is from uh, the Sentinel Satellite of European Space Agency. And what you see here is uh, the blue area in the middle is the uh, Sud wetlands with an estimated area of about 57,000 uh, square kilometers. And I looked at uh, the provinces in China. It's about the same size as Nisha, Nisha pro a province in China. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not small. It's one of the largest freshwater ecosystems, and it is the largest wetlands in Africa. However, that extent is highly variable. It depends on whether it's a wet year, a dry year, 
Uh, it depends on the wet season and the dry season, as as we can uh, as you can imagine in a uh, in a in a seasonal flooding situation. Um, the uh, the other thing I would say on this is that um, you look at this map, you see a lot of yellow and orange, and that's because of the grasslands and the shrublands. And if we do uh, if we do a summary of that area, which is in the next slide, now you see the South Sudan land cover distribution. We see most of the uh, land covers, grassland and shrubland. South Sudan, for the most part, is a semi arid country. So you can imagine that the water that comes to it, this herbaceous wetland, that blue bar that you see on the top, has great importance because it supplies uh, needed uh, services to the, to the surrounding lands, which are very dry for the most part. Okay. And I, I guess I'd like to, you know, the key message from this side is to uh, leave you with an analogy of uh, not only a sponge function of the wetlands, but also as lungs, just like the lungs of your body, you inhale uh, oxygen and that oxygen then uh, spreads to the rest of your body. The same thing with uh, the wetlands in uh, South Sudan, the Sud. Uh, they inhale not only the water, but also solar energy and nutrients from the environment and they as they exhale, if you will, a lot of that is uh, released to the environment and it provides ecosystem services. I'll give you an example. Uh, the next slide, you see an aerial view of what the uh, Sud wetlands uh, look like. And you see in this, uh, first of all, it's very flat. You see round vegetation, and these are actually floating islands of vegetation. Uh, they're about uh, 200 to 300 uh, meters across. And uh, during the high water, during the high flow periods, these vegetation floating islands that can be detached from the land. And uh, they, they, they can float in a, in a very much in the open water area. So one of the key messages here is that these wetlands have a very dynamic in, uh, environment depending on whether the water is high or whether it's low. Give you another picture. <clears throat> now here's a satellite image. Uh, coming from uh, uh, January 2020. So uh, if you look at this image, you see a burn scar there in the middle. It's that dark spot. You see a large open body of water on the lower left. Uh, this is located just above the town of Bohr, which I showed you on the, uh, on the earlier map. Now what we're going to do is look at the same area just four months later. So from January 2020, now we look at the picture to April 2020. I hope you can see, and what you see, a lot of these floating islands have collected uh, uh, in, the, in that open body area, and they were not there before. So something has changed, and we're not entirely sure what has changed. It could be the wind that has pushed them in that area. It could be something to do with the high uh, flows. There was flooding in this area, uh, in this area at that time in 2020. There's also something else that you notice. And that is that if you look at these, uh, these uh, ovals, these round uh, floating vegetation, some of them seem to have been cleared. Uh, they're brown colored. And we're not entirely sure why they are cleared. Uh, we have many different uh, possible explanations. But one of the points that comes out of this is there are many things which are going on in the suit that we don't understand. And if you're going to make some major changes in terms of the infrastructure, it is best that you understand what are these changes, what are the possible impacts. And this is just one example of that dynamic environment in four months only, same year. <clears throat> Here's another uh, satellite image, and this one is taken in uh, December 2013. December 2013 is uh, uh, in the middle of the dry season, uh, moving towards the dry season. And you can see there's a lot of uh, vegetation there. This is a little bit further north than the previous image. And what you're going to see next is the same area three years later. Three years later, let's take a look at it. And what you'll see is that again, the environment has changed dramatically. There's much more water. October is uh, towards the end of the wet season. So you see a lot more water. But once again, we see an environment that changes <clears throat> dramatically, not only within the year, but also between years. So again, you get a, 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 an idea of changing environment 
and that changing environment is so important for the ecosystem service. Uh, so Jessica, uh, are you hearing me okay, just to check? Is everything okay? Okay, I assume so. So let me continue. Yes. Okay, fine. So the next slide, uh, this is an example of the ecosystem services that are, are found within the, the suit. Here you see a uh, uh, white-eared cob and uh, another antelope by the name of, uh, called uh, Qiang. And these are uh, antelopes that also migrate depending on the availability of uh, pasture, grazing land. And in fact, uh, this, this migration is one of the largest on earth but it's not just, it's not very well known. Uh, the South Sudanese claim is possibly true that it rivals the very well-known wildebeest migrations between the Serengeti in uh, Tanzania and the Maasai Mara in uh, Kenya. But this gives you an idea of one of the ecosystem services that uh, the Sud provides. Going to the next slide, here's another example of uh, a map of migratory bird flyways. So these are birds that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, transit between Europe and uh, Africa. And you can see that the Nile River becomes a very important uh, stopover point for these, uh, for these uh, birds. And uh, I guess one of the questions that you might ask yourself if you look at this map is that obviously this is important uh, ecosystem services, but if you had to put a monetary uh, shilling or a dollar uh, value on uh, the service, it would be very hard to say what is the value of this service, not only to uh, the Nile Basin, but to those other communities who appreciate their bird wildlife. And I mention this because um, uh, the, uh, uh, the government of South Sudan is a signatory of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands of an International Importance. Uh, South Sudan acceded to that convention, but they were never able to conduct the scientific assessment required by the convention because of internal conflict that started around 2013-2014. Okay, now we move on to part three, which is the hydrology and the flooding and climate change. And uh, let's look a little bit of the science uh, behind that. We start with uh, rainfall and evapotranspiration. The first two bullets uh, lead us to a conclusion. The first one saying that there's no significant change in precipitation over the Sud in the last hundred years. However, the aerial extent has increased by some almost 20,000 square kilometers because of increased inflows. <clears throat> this is important, and I'll come back to this uh, in regards to uh, intergovernmental panel uh, on climate change a prediction for what are going on to the area. But anyway, area has increased, but no, no significant change in precipitation over the immediate environment of the sewer. The graph below uh, shows potential evapotranspiration uh, uh, throughout uh, the year. And you can see that the highest potential evapotranspiration is in March, February, March, April, where the lowest uh, levels are in June, in uh, July, August, into September, basically right now. That is the rainy season and it's what you might expect. We need to understand how, uh, how the uh, uh, evapotranspiration affects the environment because if you're planning on infrastructure, you have to know these basic uh, facts. And if you look at this graph, you see that even the estimates of something basic uh, such as potential evapotranspiration <clears throat> varies quite a bit. Uh, you know, generally they follow the, uh, the seasonality but even the, the GLEAM model at the bottom shows different results. I mean, I'm not sure quite why. But anyway, it just shows that there's a lot of unknowns in terms of this area that need to be understood. Going to the next slide, <coughs> we look at uh, the relative lake heights in the Sud uh, compared to the mean sea level as computed from NASA satellite altimetry data altimetry data. So we're measuring uh, height. And it, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, graph on the uh, top is the raw data. The one on the bottom is the smooth data. The uh, 
on the right, you see the height variation. And as if you look at these graphs, yes, there's a gap between 2002 and uh, 2008. But as you get into 2019, 2020, and through 22, you see that the lake heights have, uh, uh, you know, the open water bodies has increased as much as one meter. So if you think of that earlier aerial photo that I showed you of a very flat wetland, uh, this uh, extra meter that is going uh, on top of that is really a problem to the people who, uh, for the uh, uh, that you that live here. And this is uh, particularly a problem because uh, the IPCC uh, projections for this area is that there's going to be more rainfall in the highlands, basically in Uganda, Kenya, uh, DR Congo, that will also impact the, the future uh, stream flow to this area. Um, anyway, so very important. Imagine this uh, this uh, one extra meter that is that is uh, coming into your backyard. It's uh, it's been horrible for the, for these people. How does this look on the ground? Here is a uh, <clears throat> a pair of satellite images. One from uh, 2019 December and the second uh, from uh, December 2021. And you can see the one on the left and the one on the right. The one on the right looks a little bit darker than the one on the left. Doesn't show a lot of change, but that little bit darker is actually open water. So there's much more open water in, in uh, 2021 than there was in 2019. And it was because of this is that uh, the call for rebuilding the canal has been initiated. And uh, so we look at this and then we do an interpretation of the map. This is uh, done by the UN Satellite Center and the same area, but looking at those red spots, these are the areas uh, which have been mostly severely affected by flooding. Up to uh, close to uh, 900,000 people have been severely impacted by the flooding, just to give you an idea. Um, on the ground, what does that look like? Uh, so this is in Boretown. I mentioned that earlier. This is an example of flooding and uh, it's quite hard to get around. Uh, as you can imagine. And I have to say that uh, this is a difference, say, from, you know, uh, my country, the United States, where if we have a hurricane blow through, the water may stay around for one or two weeks. But here, when the flooding comes in, the water stays around for quite a long time, months. And uh, it can be uh, it's something that, that uh, is very hard for the local people to do. Next slide gives you an example. Uh, Here's a, here you see some children who are in their canoe and they're, uh, how do you say, obliging or encouraging cows to swim behind them. They see the ropes around their necks. What they're doing is moving the cattle to higher ground because of the flooding. And so from that, it's important to understand what are the climate change projections for East Africa, uh, again, going to the IPCC, and what the projections are, a heavy rainfall events in the highlands at global warming scenarios of two degrees or higher. They're also uh, predicting the scenarios are showing greater drought frequency, duration and, and intensity in Sud, South Sudan, Somalia, and Tanzania uh, uh, would, would increase, but maybe not so much over Kenya, Uganda, and the highlands. The conclusion is that uh, there's no high level of uncertainty but it, you should expect more flooding and drought. And right now they're looking at uh, moving the uh, water away from the sewer, but you also have to manage for the drought because of the drought will come just as much as the flooding will come. So going to the next slide. Uh, we need to talk a little bit about uh, peatlands. Peatlands, uh, as you know, are wetlands with thick waterlogged soil made up of dead and decaying plants. And this is one of the major car carbon sinks uh, globally. Uh, peatlands are one of the largest uh, carbon stores in the world. In uh, countries such as uh, Indonesia, the damaged peatlands have been a major source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions responsible for almost 5% of global anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Here's an example of uh, researchers taking a, a peat core from uh, the Sud wetlands. Very high, very high uh, uh, carbon concentration. And here you see a, uh, a graph of the proportional distribution of the peatlands in the Nile Basin. 
And what you see that big green slice is for South Sudan. And that big green slice of the pie is actually due almost uh, mostly to the uh, Sud wetlands. So the important uh, message here is that uh, these wetlands serve as uh, important tropical uh, carbon sinks uh, in the Nile Basin. Going to the next slide, we're looking at soil carbon as seen from space. These are from the International Soil Reference and Information uh, Center, ISRI. And again, you see that uh, our area is the sewed, and uh, it shows high uh, uh, soil carbon. <clears throat> the surrounding areas are very light because the soil carbon is far left. Imagine if you drained the, uh, the wetland, that dark would turn to light, and uh, there would be uh, so much uh, uh, carbon released to the atmosphere. Uh, now looking at the uh, methane, we're, this is a data from the troposphere monitoring instrument uh, and it's showing a methane hotspot. So this also attracts uh, <clears throat> global attention because is the suit an area that is emitting a high methane, which as you know, is a, a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is the source of this methane? And although we don't fully know the answer, the, uh, the cow population, the cattle population in South Sudan is uh, over 47 million. It's pro approximately 10 cows per uh, individuals. And it is possible that these cows indeed are the source of this methane uh, release that we're seeing here. It's amazing to see that but with 47 million cows is a lot of cows. Uh, Anyway, another research topic that needs to be better understood. Going to the next slide, um, these are areas for research. We need to understand uh, the soil carbon for possible carbon offsetting and trading. We need to understand better how flooding leads to carbon sequestration while drainage releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere for these tropical wetlands. This is what uh, common knowledge says, but this has to be confirmed in the sewed wetlands where we have very little in situ data, very little ground data. And then uh, uh, the methane uh, emissions from the wetlands is, uh, is something that still is an ambiguity uh, globally and that we need to understand its contribution to the methane budget at the global level. Going to uh, part four, the livelihoods and the valuing the ecosystems. Uh, We'd like to look at now the inhabitants and uh, how they how they uh, survive on these ecosystem services. You see uh, some settlements along the lot uh, Nile, along the White Nile. These are dispersed due to the micro conditions. This is uh, during what they call a, a dry season land, and the people are able to live here as the as the flood is lower. Uh, and it gives you an impression of a society that may not have developed much in the last one hundred years. It brings up the question, what is the proper trade-off between maintaining such societies on one hand and other wider development of, of priorities, whether it be for hydroelectric energy production or agriculture? There's no simple answer to these questions, but this is a, the, the kind of uh, questions that they're faced. Going to the next slide, the main uh, productive assets in the region are, is of course, land, fishing equipment, and the cattle, goats, and from these assets, uh, we they cultivate sorghum, maize, groundnuts, and uh, they catch fish, and uh, they have milk and meat from the cattle. This is what this is what maintains uh, this region. Here we have an aerial view of the uh, life uh, of a, a, a small village with the livestock in the middle. This is uh, in Toich or seasonal dryland grassland. Uh, uh, Toich is uh, a local term which uh, uh, refers to the grasslands which are available in the dry season and most important for the cattle, uh, cattle in South Sudan. <clears throat> Here we see an example of a small fishing camp, very small, a few people that have been able to uh, uh, find a little bit of solid land and they use this as their fishing base and they catch a fish, much of it tilapia in the surrounding stagnant water. Uh, these are just temporary camps. And here you see, uh, again, local processing. It looks like they're uh, using, they're conserving their catch with, and then they take it to the market as best they can. But again, 
you can imagine that accessing these places is very difficult. There's no road, you, you travel by water. Uh, now we move to uh, ecosystem services and uh, the main categories of ecosystem services are, are provisioning, regulating, cultural and support services. Uh, the most, ones we're most familiar with and are easiest to measure are food, steel wood, fiber for clothes and timber for construction. The ones that are harder to uh, uh, measure and quantify would be things such as pest regulation, climate regulation, pollination, uh, soil formation for support services, but the, the hardest to, of all probably to, uh, to, to measure are those cultural services, the spiritual, the recreational aspects that the Sioux provides. And one of the key questions here is that uh, these cultural services sound, uh, serve as a foundation for the societies that live there and provides a, a certain um, security to the region. If you take the cultural services away, you add to the insecurity and raises the question is how can you put a dollar value or a shilling value, in this case, a pound value on peace that the cultural services provide, particularly in a young country such as South Sudan, which is actually the youngest, uh, youngest country in the world uh, at, this, at this point in time. To uh, the next slide, we're looking at the valuation of the ecosystem services. Um, the Nile Basin Initiative uh, values the ecosystem services of the Sioux at uh, over $3.3 billion. Uh, and uh, I, I won't go around uh, all of these specific elements, but uh, what we found when we did the assessment that they value the cultural and spiritual aspect of the Sioux at less than $150,000. Dollars is uh, three point three billion, and for us, we feel that uh, that service has been uh, that ecosystem service has been undervalued. Destroy the soup, destroy some of these cultures that have been there for centuries. The people that live in it, it would be uh, uh, how do you say an additional uh, an additional uh, uh, impact on uh, those cultures which have been uh, fighting through uh, uh, conflict over this recent period. Going to the uh, challenges and opportunities is that if you value the suit at $3.3 billion, but the people who are living there are not benefit, benefiting from that, uh, it, be, it poses a difficult management question. Tourism, uh, looking at the, the wildlife there, uh, is valued at $600 million per year, but it cannot happen while insecurity and access is a problem. Fishing has potential, but there's a lack of eco, uh, there's a lack, lack of infrastructure. Uh, in terms of payment for ecosystem services, who should pay to maintain this, uh, uh, this service? Because if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. And if you uh, cannot uh, manage it, then the, op the option of draining the swamp becomes reality because uh, in your mind, the suit has no uh, value if you cannot measure it. Going to the next slide and the final part of the presentation, we're looking at a research program for the suit wetlands. And uh, these are some key questions that you might consider uh, if you are a graduate student or if you are uh, uh, an official of the uh, South Sudanese government. Uh, the main question is, is about water, whether it's water for ecosystem services or flood control, which are uh, some of the immediate questions, but the country has bigger uh, goals for electricity generation and irrigation. Knowledge gaps uh, related to these management needs uh, relate to hydrology, role as carbon sink or source, role in flood prevention, and the, its capacity to modulate uh, the regional climate. I didn't talk about oil production, but it's a, it's a key issue for the area. We can talk about that in the discussion. Examples of specific questions that need science to inform what are the evapotranspiration rates in the suit, uh, particularly in connection with any planned structural development, and how much of that moisture <clears throat> that is evaporated or transport actually makes its way back into the system and find its way back into the Nile River. This has not been calculated, but it's certainly a, uh, it's a need uh, if you're planning on doing any infrastructure. Uh, other questions related to hydrology, what are the peak and low flows needed to maintain ecosystem services to support livelihoods? And I accent 
both peak and low flows are needed. Uh, average flows are, are not uh, the issue here. You need both peak and low flows. What is the vol <coughs> volume of stream flow that uh, needs to be reduced to avoid catastrophic flooding in the sewer? Is it possible to reopen the Dome Lake Canal and send some portion of the high flows downstream? Certainly there are downstream countries who are very interested in this option. Either way, you need to assess the accuracy of the current estimates for stream flow volume. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse gases and uh, uh, climate change, we have to understand uh, the source and sink behavior uh, for carbon in this uh, area. We mentioned uh, that and how to interpret the latest IPCC projections for East Africa as you're planning predictive management of the wetlands resource. Um, fine, continue. Uh, for the social sciences, how do we put a uh, dollar figure on cultural value? Well, which environmental and social impact assess assessments are required if the Jung Lake Canal is started? Uh, what is the value of wetlands for migratory bird species? What is the value of the wetlands for migratory animal species? All these questions uh, don't have a good answer and uh, need further research. Uh, this constraints for the science agenda, access, as you can see, there's few roads that go into this area. Security has been a problem. It's improved somewhat, but still remains a problem. Funding uh, is an issue. And whatever solution that you uh, choose to promote the science agenda, capacity building in, co in cooperation with uh, the local authorities is needed. Uh, key recommendations coming out of the uh, uh, of the assessment is that we need to examine the policies, practices, and the impacts of the possible revival of the Jungle Lake Canal, uh, where the government of South Sudan should adhere to the main principle of water for the South Sudanese people and ecosystems first, a little bit like the case in Ethiopia. Uh, anytime there is a, a, a an infrastructure pro project, an environmental and social impact assessment must be conducted. There's a need for an early warning system for flood and drought, uh, probably in conjunction uh, uh, with the uh, Ugandans uh, from where the water is coming from, improving flood co control measures and helping the local economies recover. And the big point uh, from that we uh, recommend from UNIFSITE is to reduce uncertainties by promoting scientific research. Uh, the conclusions are that uh, the interplay among science policy and politics is complex and dynamic, but do offer incredible research opportunities for Tongji University and its Institute for Environmentally Sustainable Development. Here's an example of a great need for science to inform policy uh, and influence politics. The barriers are high, but the potential benefits are even higher. And finally, as I said previously, capacity building must be part of any uh, research program. Now to finish, I just wanted to uh, make the tie back to politics. And here you're seeing a uh, page one of uh, the national English newspaper. This is from, uh, I believe this is from June 30th, the date is on this one. And it says dredging project formally approved by, uh, by the cabinet. So dredging is not the canal, it's a temporary solution. But still, it's a big issue for the, for the South Sudanese because you're going to uh, uh, any dredging project would uh, change the environment. So this, this is page one of, uh, on, um, on June 30th. A few days later, on 6th of June, we see the same newspaper saying South Sudan to lose millions of dollars on a Nile dredging. Uh, and it uh, quotes, a, quotes a, a report. This is July 6th of this, uh, of this month. We look at the next one, and this is also on July 6th. This is dredging sued wetlands could disastrous if rushed. This is the, the UNEP report that is the focus of today's uh, uh, discussion. And believe it or not, nowhere in the UNEP report uh, suggests that uh, uh, dredging would be disastrous. What we suggest is to do an environmental and social impact assessment if you're going to do that. But media is what is and they will say what they want to in order to get a good story. Uh, this is a this is a case of that. And then the final slide. This is uh, just from a, a few days ago. Uh, the president of South Sudan has ordered the suspension of all dredging related activities until an environmental impact assessment is conducted. And in his address on the 11th anniversary of independence, the president here directed the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to conduct a feasibility studies on the issue. 
So from the side of uh, UNEP, uh, this is uh, one specific example of where science has been able, uh, assessment science has been able to influence a uh, policy. And uh, uh, I find it uh, very interesting. Oftentimes uh, science that only indirectly influences policy, but here you have a direct example. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd uh, welcome uh, the, question, uh, the question. Sorry for taking a little bit uh, too long, but uh, I hope this was of interest to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It was a very impressive um, presentation. We got to know uh, what is happening in South Sudan in the Sioux wetlands. Uh, I think we only have a few minutes for uh, questions from the audience and uh, professors and students. If you do have any question, please raise your hand or uh, you can leave messages in the chat box. Um, I'm not sure whether there's any questions from, I see a question from Edwin. Um, Peter, uh, Edwin is asking, are there opportunities to build dams in the area to prevent flooding and store water rather than draining the swamp? Yeah, do you want me, uh, Jessica, do you want me to take these questions one by one? Um, right now, I have only got this question from the chat box. If others okay. have any questions, please leave the message. I think you can also take the time to answer this question first, I guess. Definitely, definitely. In the town of Nibule, which is uh, just beyond the Ugandan border, there's talk of building a reservoir to be able to uh, control, uh, you know, the flow of the water and also potentially uh, look at the question of dams for hydroelectric and uh, uh, agricultural uh, irrigation. Uh, the, the main answer to this question is to look at the big picture. What I showed you in the uh, newspaper headlines was that uh, dredging is on the table right now, but dredging is a, a band-aid solution, a bandage solution, a temporary solution. The bigger uh, development uh, picture for the country needs to be understood Science needs to be uh, 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 conducted to uh, support these main issues. But yes, they are looking at uh, the idea of dams. They look at the Ethiopian uh, uh, experience and they would like to see how much of that could apply to South Sudan. I think that um, it is one of the options. Reservoir, uh, the National Agricultural Plan talks about irrigation agriculture and uh, the need for a hydroelectric uh, energy source is real, it's there, that they're discussing. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, Professor Lee asked a question about how can we join the program? I guess you just mentioned that the president of South Sudan just ordered a suspension of the project um, of, of draining the, the wetlands um, before uh, an comprehensive environment assessment uh, can be done for, for this. Um, I'm not sure whether is there any institution or university or international organization already take the lead? And is there any possibility, like Professor Lee mentioned, that whether uh, we can participate or contribute or, or provide uh, anything? Yes, that, that is a key question, a, a very key question. And basically what, just to give you a, uh, an idea of the funding for this and the possibilities for doing uh, a research program, uh, UNEP uh, is played a critical role. So the Global Environment Facility or GEF provided some funding to the South, the government of South Sudan to do uh, various uh, activities related to the environment. That funding was put to the uh, purpose of producing this rapid assessment because they felt the political pressure of uh, uh, rebuilding the Jonga Lake Canal. So one of the recommendations that needs to come out of this, and I think it will, is that UNEP, or if you will, government of South Sudan needs to pressure UNEP to find additional funding resources, for example, through GEF, uh, to uh, conduct some of this research. Now, the work that we've been discussing with uh, IESD has been trying to open doors for more international cooperation. These these, uh, uh, you know, such research program development may take a couple of years, but there are possibilities there because the need is there. What I hope that, I hope you understood today is that this is a, a region that is important, not only for the South Sudanese, but also regionally, also globally, it is important. 
So there will be funding that will be uh, applied to this, whether through GEF or other uh, sources. And I think the, 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 the objective of Home G University and IESD, and particularly the graduate students who are looking for uh, research ideas, uh, whether it's master's thesis or PhD dis dissertations, is to try and find those topics which uh, address the interplay between the science, the policy, and if you will, the politics. Uh, because uh, th those kinds of uh, uh, research uh, initiatives are definitely needed. Funding will become there. It'll take time to build it, but it's there. Thank you, Peter. Any more questions from the audience? I don't, uh, Jessica, I don't know from the Ministry of, uh, of Environment and Forestry, uh, Paul Dimitri said he would join us if Paul is there. It might uh, be nice to hear briefly just a quick word from him. Uh, I don't know if Paul is uh, on the list of uh, participants. I think they can. Sorry, who? Paul, are you there? Paul? Maybe not. If not, we go on, but I just wanted to give, uh, he said he was going to attend. Okay. I'm not sure whether we have any students actually from South Sudan. Uh, but I do see um, many students from Africa. Sure. We have some students from uh, Kenya, Ethiopia. So yes, I think uh, maybe we can invite some uh, graduate and a PhD student to join this and uh, uh, some professor, their supervisor. I think for this project, it's better we apply the funding for the International Cooperation Agency of China government is better for the cooperation. That would one be one piece of the solution, uh, Professor Lee. And that if you could combine that with GEF funding, as you and I have discussed, uh, uh, at the demand from the South Sudanese government with the United Nations of providing a, an umbrella, that would be mm -hmm. uh, that would be a uh, that would be a mission for uh, us to pursue. Uh, between China and the UNEP, uh, we have the trust fund from the government of uh, China. Maybe th this is another channel we can apply the funding for the cooperation with the South Sudan uh, Research Institute. Yeah. yeah. South, South Sudan is a, uh, no, it is, uh, it is a country that is <laughs> further behind than uh, Kenya, if you will. There are other opportunities across other African countries. I, I brought the uh, issue of South Sudan uh, uh, forward because it was, it's a UNEP activity, just as the work with Tongji Uni University is a UNEP uh, activity. Mm -hmm. And trying to bring those two pieces together would be something that UNEP should see of great value. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, I guess it would be uh, good to um, go through the different channels and not particularly through uh, GEF, the Global Environment Facility, since they're already involved and have a lot of interest in it. I see a student uh, having a question, but it's incomplete. Um, Aji Masi, do you want to just open your mic and video to, to ask? Your question. We still we we are almost running out of the, the the time. But if you if you already have the question, uh, yes, uh, I have. Yes. Okay. Um, regarding the 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 dam in the Nile River in Ethiopia, uh, more of the dam is built for hydroelectric power generation. So since this dam is hydroelectric power uh, and it, it, it cannot consume water uh, after filling the dam, so how can affect the downstream countries uh, since it is uh, it, it cannot consume water and since it is hydroelectric power, if my question is clear for the professor. So I, I can answer that question. Yes, if the dam's purpose is solely for hydroelectric uh, energy production, and it is not used for agricultural irrigation, then of course uh, there should be minimal uh, water loss. Uh, 
Um, the only thing that I would say uh, to that, and and I think that that is very important. Uh, if you go to irrigation agriculture, of course, uh, the loss of uh, water to evapotranspiration becomes a bigger issue. If it's just for hydroelectric power, uh, then uh, the issues are minimal. But um, you know, in my experience working with the United Nations, looking at uh, Lake Chad in uh, Central Africa, looking at uh, the Aral Sea in uh, Central Asia, looking at Lake Urmaya in Iran, looking at the Great Salt Lake in uh, Western United States. Although each of those bodies are inland water bodies, they don't flow to the, uh, to the sea. Nevertheless, the history repeats itself and again and again that if you take water away from uh, an in inland water body, such as those which I mentioned, history has repeated itself that there has been uh, environmental impacts that had not been understood before the draining was started. And uh, we can go into detail on those. And so the key message is here is that, yes, make sure that if you take water away, you understand the environmental impacts because human history has shown that uh, we've not done a good job of assessing the environmental impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think we are also out of time. And um, thank you so much for today's lecture. It was really excellent. And we get a very good interaction with, uh, with the students and professors as well. Um, Professor Lee, do you want to conclude? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter. It's uh, our honor you give us the lecture and uh, let our students and the professors to know the situation about the wetland in the south of Sudan. I hope our prof professor and uh, some uh, uh, graduate and PhD students can join the program and uh, we, can come, we can discuss the detail when you come to Tongji University. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, my great pleasure. Professor Wang, do you want to say a few uh, words? Yeah, <laughs> I would like to say thank you for Mr. Gilru's uh, fabulous presentation to us. And I learned a lot. Actually, I have a question, but we can talk later because we are um, very tight of the time of this lecture. Uh, anyway, thank you so much. And we are really looking forward to see you face to face in the campus um, as soon as possible. <laughs> thank you. You know, Professor Wang Ying, I'm fully vaccinated and ready to come. <laughs> okay, that's great. Very good news for me today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, professors and students. If you have any ideas regarding this specific topic, um, you can also write to us. We will communicate with Peter and other uh, relevant organizations. Okay. Thank you very much for attending today's uh, lecture. Thank you, Peter, for your time. And everyone, uh, have a good afternoon or a good day there. Thank you so much. Thank bye you. Bye. Good day to all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you bye all. Bye-bye.